In this video, I will teach you my personal strategy for the reading section on the SAT. I have combined a few strategies I pulled from Erica Meltzer and the SAT Black Book, and I added, sprinkled in some of my own. I will talk to you about the strategies and also show you how I approach a particular passage. So we will be solving it together. I'm Kat Sieverson, the inventor of the Sieverson method, a scientifically proven way to learn anything fast, including this guy. So many of my students have a really hard time with 65 minutes, 52 questions, five passages. And if you are someone who hasn't seen our reading video on how to improve your reading diet to score well on the SAT, I'm going to link this video up here and I will also make it a suggested video. So if you just keep watching at the end of this video, the reading diet video will become suggested and you just can go right ahead and watch that. So what we were talking about there is that it's essential to acquire a skill of reading comprehension before we can go into any strategies. Reading comprehension is this ability to make meaning from text. It's this ability to look at little squiggles on white paper and understand what those squiggles are saying, your ability to make meaning from text. And it varies from text to text because each type of material, social science, natural science, history, uh, or fiction, all have its own pattern, its own way of conveying information. Now, let's assume that you have passed the level of making meaning from text, and now you can confidently and accurately decipher what the text is saying and what the paragraph is saying overall and what the passage is trying to do. Now it's time to get to the tricks of the SAT. The SAT has one big flaw which you and I as test takers can take advantage of. SAT is a standardized test. You know what else that means? It's a multiple choice test. That means out of four answer choices that are offered to you, one and only one answer choice is correct, and three are absolutely wrong. I realize this must not be like a huge revelation to you guys. Duh. One answer choice is right and three are wrong. But so many of you actually don't understand this deeply in your heart. Many of you have an easier time eliminating the two and then kind of thinking about the last two answer choices that are standing and well, they can both be right. I don't know which one's correct. Mm -mm. It doesn't work like this on the SAT reading section. With a little bit of training, believe me, I've done it. Um, I didn't start scoring 400 on the reading section of the SAT right away. <laughs> Not nearly. I had to work at it. I had to work much harder than everybody else because I had dyslexia, if you guys know a little bit about me. You can train yourself to recognize those particular tricks and traps that the SAT is setting out for you. But let's first talk about this standardization nature of the SAT test. When you think about reading, you probably think about reading in the context of your English class. Every time you go and discuss a novel or any reading material with your English teacher, and your English teacher is very excited every time you raise your hand and try to express your opinion. Reading teachers or English language teachers, literature teachers, they try not to reprimand you for having an opinion. They're trying to, quite on the contrary, incentivize you for thinking outside of the box, making um, connections that are perhaps not quite orthodox, maybe unorthodox connections. They are incentivizing you to interpret and um, go beyond the reach of the author. Have you ever read Toni Morrison's books? It's all about making inferences and interpretations. If you were to read Toni Morrison on the SAT, you are not allowed to step away from the text, even by a little bit. SAT is legally obligated to leave you only one correct answer choice and three incorrect answer choices. And since interpretation is very personal, they cannot make interpretation a correct answer. There are only two approaches SAT could possibly create 
answer choices for you. One approach they could take is restatement. So basically they would restate something that was exactly, explicitly said in the text. So if I say in the text that innovation drives progress, I can restate that using synonyms or paraphrase that and I could say that inventing new things leads to um, innovation or progress in technology. I said the exact same thing, different words, restatement. So that's one way SAT can create new um, absolutely 100% correct answer choices that are indisputable. The second way they can create those absolutely 100% indisputable answer choices is they can do demonstration. So for example, there is a scenario or an example that exists in the text. What they can do is they can take the description of this example and summarize this example and use it as the correct answer choice. They can do on the contrary. Let's say there is a description of a concept or an event and the scenario or the example that describes that could be the correct answer choice. I'll show you when we go through the passage, it will all make sense. But there are only two ways. It's either a restatement or a demo. You can either take a scenario and use the description of this scenario as the right answer choice or you can take a statement from um, the passage or claim and then re, um, demonstrate it as an example and say, uh, state it as the correct answer choice. But if it were that easy, Katya, wouldn't everyone just get 400 on the SAT all of the time? Exactly. I think everyone should be getting 400 on SAT reading all of the time because it's really easy with practice to identify those 100% correct answer choices. But the SAT is trying to trick you and actually push you to do something that you don't want to do, but you're so instinct instinctively wired to do, which is interpret. Think outside of the box. Make unorthodox connections. Because in the English language classes, when you were reading and working with sex, that's exactly what you were doing. So they will give you a question like, uh, this evidence from line 57 to line 63 most nearly means. Mm -mm. They're not asking you for what it most nearly means. They're asking you for what is the only one thing that it could possibly mean. They're not asking you to choose the best answer out of many. They're actually asking you for the exact and only one possible interpretation. If they say that this answer or this word most nearly means mm -mm, they're asking you for one exact interpretation. So once you understand what the right answer choice looks like, it's also very important to understand what a wrong answer choice would look like. So here are some features. The answer choice could be too narrow, too specific, or too broad. Words like all, many, every, all the time are usually incorrect. So it probably means that the answer choice is too broad and probably wrong. Something that's too narrow, that's talking about the zookeepers from Nebraska, it's probably too narrow. An alarm should go off in your head when you see that. Just make sure that you are checking that all of your too specific or too broad answer choices are supported by the passage. Most of the times they're not. So that's usually a trap. The second type of the trap that I like to talk about is uses words from the passage, says something else. Oftentimes it would actually contradict the words and um, what the words are saying in the passage. For example, innovation drives progress is a direct quote from your passage. And what your trappy answer would say, it would, it would leave two words, innovation and progress, but instead of the word drives, it would use the word hinders. So uses words from the passage, says something else, oftentimes contradicts. The third type of the answer choice is perfect answer except for this one word. Don't forget, a single word can make the answer choice incorrect. 
So if you're feeling like, well, is it specifically about this planet? Is it specifically about this type of supermarket or uh, cosmetic brand? It's probably this type of a trap. Unless you can find proof in the passage and then, the, then your answer choice is directly either demonstrating or restating the passage, this answer choice is wrong. So the type of this trap is called perfect answer apart from this one word definitely a trap. The fourth one is true in the real world, but not supported by the passage. Let's go back to our example with progress and innovation. So let's say I'm reading a passage by a historian, maybe it's like a paired passage, and one of the historians is building an argument that actually progress is against um, innovation. Progress should be um, coming naturally, and maybe this person is against um, technology, so they're actually saying that innovation is no good for progress. But you know that innovation is good for progress. So if this is one of the answer choices, most of the kids are going to choose that because um, from the number of SAT tests that I've taken, I see kids just, you know, kind of casually looking through passages, they finish ahead of time, they're not even taking the time to read and understand it. So they look at the answer choices and whichever sounds right, that's the one they pick. So don't fall um, victim for these types of traps. If it's true in real life, but there's no support in the passage, it's wrong. Because you remember that there are only two ways for the SAT to make the right answers. First is through restatement and the second is through demonstration. If it's neither, it cannot be the right answer choice. Then no matter how much they try to sway you and propel you into inferences and making connections, it's all BS. <laughs> One more type of um, trap I want you to be aware of is uses words from the passage, supported by the passage, but does not answer the question. I've seen it so many times with my students where they would notice a little detail, something like a shiny object, and they would, oh, mermaid, oh, mushroom, oh, I've seen it in the passage. And what they would do, they would read the question, and then they would also start to read the answer choices. I know, I used to do that too. I used to read answer choices along with the question. Now I know better. I only try to read answer choices when I have to, but for the most part, I try to come up with my own answer first and then try to match what I just said to the information that's provided in the answer choices. But when my students start to like live in the answer choices, they notice, oh, mermaid, oh yeah, I've seen it in the passage. And then they go to the part of the passage that talks about this shiny object and then they confirm that in fact, this statement is true, confirmed by the passage. Okay, now I'm ready. It's restatement or demonstration. It's confirmed by the passage. But the tricky situation is with this trap is it does not answer the question. The question is asking about something other than this shiny object. And the shiny object is just there to take your points away. <laughs> so now we've um, done a significant number of talking, significant number of minutes of talking and there are many 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 videos on YouTube that just gives you um, kind of um, watery type of strategies that are not supported by um, a real walkthrough through the passage so I'm inviting you to do a real walkthrough we're going to do a let's do a natural science passage from test say five so it's going to be Five, five. So it's going to be the fifth passage of test number five and I'm going to solve it and we're just going to point camera at my um, sheet of paper. I'm going to be using just a printout of the test. I'm going to be underlining and I'm going to just walk you through my thought process and um, I really hope you will find this helpful. All right, let's do it. All right, so this is question 42 to 52. We should be expecting 10 questions. And the first thing I like to read is I always like to read the blurb. It gives me an idea of when the passage was written, who wrote it, and you know, the title plays a huge role. This passage is, oh my God, from Joshua 4. 
I have to tell you about Joshua Four. I love this guy. And this book, Moonwalking with Einstein, is actually a very good suggestion in addition to your um, reading diet. So take a note of that. Joshua Four, The Art and Science of Remembering Everything. Okay. So the second thing I'm going to do is I'm not going to read the, uh, the test yet. No, no, no. The, the next thing after we read the blurb, we're going to turn to questions. Some of you may think that this approach is crazy, but it's, this approach works for me. And today I'm going to teach you what works for me. So question number, number 42. According to the passage, uh, McGuire's findings regarding taxi drivers are significant because they. Okay, now we know that there's a dude, maybe a woman, McGuire, and they make some findings um, and there are some taxi drivers. Okay, which choice? Okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to circle question number 42 because 42 and 43 are together. And the way I approach these questions, and I always approach them together, I always kind of start solving from the back and they go to the front. I'm going to explain to you why so, so that I don't miss the fact that 42 is an evidence-based question. I'm just going to circle it, mark it up. As used in line 24, basic most nearly means. Now I'm going to turn back to my passage. I'm going to find the word basic. I'm going to put number, the question number, no, question number 44 next to it. Do you know why I'm doing this? Because I don't want to read this text, then get all the way to the end of it. Then look at the questions, be like, oh, basic. Now I have to reread this portion of the text. Mm -mm. I'm going to solve this vocabulary in question question if I could right then and there um, I will just make sure that I read everything above and everything below for the rest of the passage and I have a very confident feel about my ability to figure out the vocabulary and contents there all right which question was McGuire's study of mental athlete primarily intended to answer all right so this McGuire person man or woman her study his study of mental athletes they wanted to answer some question. I guarantee you there will be an, um, there will be a quote. Well, I know there will be a quote because this is an evidence-based question. So we're going to circle 42 and 45. 46, 47 is next. As used in line 39, matched. You guys know what I'm going to do. I'm going to flip back to my text. And I'm going to find 39. And I'm going to find the word matched right here. And I'm going to put the question number 47. I'm going to continue. The main purpose of fifth paragraph, 5765. So this is from here all the way to here. This is 48. And this is the purpose. So basically, this is kind of like a rhetorical reading because we need to find what does this paragraph do for the main purpose. According to the passage, when compared to mental athletes, the individuals in control group in McGuire's second study. All right. Compared to mental athletes, so we have mental athletes and individuals in the control group in the second study. So there was a second study that was a control group. So we're just going to pay attention to all of these players. The passage most strongly suggests that mental athletes are successful at memorization because. Okay, great. So the passage most strongly suggests that means the passage absolutely 100% says that mental athletes are successful at memorization. And then again, see 51 is, in, is making 50 an evidence-based question. But because they're trying to play with your, with your brain and make your life a little bit harder, they refuse to put these questions uh, on top of each other. They try to like space it out and that's why we oftentimes see how the first part of the question and the second part of the question are split up between two pages. So I don't like that about USAT. 52, the question in line 74 and 78 primarily serve. So we need to go back to the text. 74 to 78. Why would mental athletes? And they primarily serve to do one thing or another. Okay. Now, what have we done by just reading these questions? I like to think of this as priming. I'm now priming my brain for all of this information. This little um, article of 90 lines is going to have maybe 100 details. And I only need to pay attention to eight. And now I've highlighted those eight details for myself. And 
it's much easier to navigate the passage now. So now I know there's going to be some McGuire. She's going to have some study about a taxi driver. There's going to be something about mental athletes. There's going to be a control group. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, let's begin reading. In 2000, a neuroscientist at University College London known Eleanor McGuire. Eleanor McGuire was a woman. She is a woman. Um, another thing that I do, I always try to circle personal names and when it's necessary, I try to box non-personal names. Especially in the fiction passages, I find it's very helpful to distinguish between the two because somehow our brain interprets anything that begins with a capital letter as a name and if um, if it's lay Layla it's or it's LA it's another thing so just to help myself personal name circle non-personal name box if you don't find this technique felt helpful fine but give it a shot it really works for me um, named Eleanor McGuire wanted to find out what effect if any all that driving around the labyrinth street labyrinthine I'm not sure how to pronounce it but something through with labyrinth streets of London might have on cabbies brains okay this is what she wanted to find out um, when she uh, when she brought 16 taxi drivers into her lab and examined their brains in an MRI scanner she found one surprising important difference okay so she did the first study the right posterior hippocampus a part of the brain known to be involved in spatial navigation was 7% larger than normal in the cabbies a small but very significant difference all right um, Maggie concluded that all that wayfinding around London had physically altered the gross culture of their brains the more years a cabbie had been on the road the more pronounced the effect so this is the first passage this is the first paragraph of this passage talking about her first study and that the hippocampus of the cabbies was larger great the brain is a mutable organ capable and then but within dashes which means let me clarify what I mean when I say capable within limits of reorganizing itself and readapting to new kinds of sensory input a phenomenon known neuroplasticity so neuroplasticity is that it had long been thought that the adult brain was capable of sprawling new neurons dash that was that while learning caused synopsis rearrange them and new links between brain cells to form the brain's basic anatomical structure was more or less static okay while a learning caused synapses to rearrange themselves and new links between brains caused them the brain's basic an anatomical structure was more or less static the brains let me just think of a word that would also work here the brains um, basic anatomical structure the brains um, existing anatomical structure was more or less static that's what they're trying to say all right so now what I did is I tried to come up with a word that would be a find replacer here now I'm gonna to go to question 44 and see what they're giving me initial simple necessary and fundamental well I'm going to first um, eliminate some of the answer choices here's what I think necessary is it really necessary anatomical structure that stays more or less static I don't think so I think we're talking about uh, we're not talking about simple anatomical structure and we're not talking about initial anatomical structure because initial anatomical structure implies um, the anatomical structure of an infant so it's got to be fundamental another trick that I like to do is I like to for VIC vocabulary in question um, vocabulary in context questions I, I like to take this word and plug it back into the sentence while learning caused synapses to rearrange themselves and, and new links between brain cells to form, the brain's fundamental anatomical structure was more or less static. That is very similar to what I said, which is existing. Uh, McGuire's study suggested old inherited wisdom was simply not true. Okay, so she is, which is oftentimes common with um, natural science passages, is that they're trying to challenge the existing convention. 
after her groundbreaking study of London cabbies, so that is kind of the opener, Maggie decided to turn her attention to mental athletes. So after cabbies, she turned to mental athletes. She teamed up with Elizabeth Valentine and, you know, I'm going to do that, these, these two authors of Academic Monograph, Superior Memory, to study 10 individuals who had finished near the top of the World Memory Championship. They wanted to find out if the memorizer's brain were, like the London cabbies, structurally different from the rest of ours, or if they were somehow just making better use of memory abilities that we all possess. Ha ha! I remember we had a question about what does it, what is it that McGuire wanted to know when she was designing her second, um, her second study. Well, I just found that. And which question was McGuire studies mental athletes primarily intended to answer? Here we go. And I actually marked that up here. Let's just find if anything matches. Um, 27, 29 after athletes. So we just go back 27 after athletes decided to attend her mental. Mm, no, this doesn't, this does not talk about her primary purpose. She, what type of question she intended to answer? Yes, it does talk about the study, but it does not give me the answer. 33 to 37, they possess 33. They wanted to find out if the memorizer's brains were structurally different from the rest of ours if they were somehow just making better use of yeah that's exactly what they wanted to find out that was the question all right so i think these are my quotes but i'm just going to check the, these just for fun research is scanned what's range so 30 38 43 the researchers know and this one 52 54 what's range What's more, every single journal? Nope, 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 nope. So this is our answer choices. These are our lines. And let's look at the question that matches. So she basically wanted to find out if they also use their brains differently. There's like a structural difference. Does the act of memorization make use of, uh, make use of different brain structures that does the act of navigation? Well, I don't think that's it. Do mental athletes inherit their unusual brain structures or do the structures develop as a result of a specific activities? No, the, this did not say did they inherit it or did they develop it. I don't think that's what it says. Does heightened memorization ability reflect abnormal brain structure or an unusual use of normal brain structure? I think that's more like it. Let's just reread these one more time. Because remember, restatement or demonstration here, that we should be seeing a clear, clear restatement. They wanted to find out if memorizers' brain were, like the London cabbies, structurally different from the rest of ours. Or if they were somehow just making better use of memory abilities that we all possess. So we should be finding something that is paraphrasing what we just read. Do mental athletes inherit? Was there anything about inheriting? No. Does heightened memorization ability reflect abnormal brain structure or an unusual use of brain structure? I think that's more like it. And what is the relationship between general cognitive ability and the unusual brain structure of mental athletes? No. She wanted to know, just to make it super duper clear, I'm sure you guys are already understanding it. They wanted to find out if memorizers' brain were structurally different from the rest of ours so that's what they were interested in or if they were somehow just making a better use of memory abilities that they already possess the only thing that says exactly that is oops answer choice c all right so we're done here the researchers put both the mental athletes and a group of matched control subjects into mri scan scanners and ask them to memorize three digit numbers black and white photographs of people's faces and magnified images of snowflakes while their brains were being scanned okay matched control subjects well control subjects it's already telling me that those are control so they have to be like similar i'm assuming um teen, teen, teen. question number right here um competing 
control subjects? I don't think so. Distinguishable control subjects? No. Identical control subjects or comparable? Well, it's really difficult to find identical com uh, control subjects, but comparable? Very easily. Um, so this 47 is going to be A, and then I'm going to continue reading. McGuire and her team thought it was possible that they might discover anatomical differences in the brains of, of memory champs. So she was thinking there will be some anatomical differences. Evidence that their brains had somehow reorganized themselves in the process of doing all the intensive remembering. So this is what she's hoping. But when the researchers reviewed the uh, imaging, not a single significant structural difference turned up. Mm -hmm. The brains of the mental athletes appeared to be indistinguishable from those of the group of the control subjects. What's more, on every single test in general cognitive ability, the mental athletes' scores came back well within the normal range. The memory champs weren't smarter and they didn't have special brains. Okay, so these are the findings, but apparently we don't have a question about that. Um, but there was one telling difference between the brains of the mental athletes and the control subjects. Okay, we do have a question about this. I just want to remember what the question is. Oh, it's about the purpose. When the researchers looked at which parts of the brains were lighting up when the mental athletes were memorizing, they found that they were activating entirely different circuitry according to the functional MRIs, fMRIs. The regions of the brain that were less active in the control subjects seem to be working in overdrive for the mental athletes. Okay, so what does this say? What does this paragraph, just this paragraph, what does it do? It talks to us that there is a big difference between mental athletes and brains of people in control group. And they're saying that um, regions of the brain that were less active in the control subjects seem to be working on overdrive for the mental athletes. Okay. What does that tell us? Well, that's kind of like what, what this study revealed. It did not reveal what um, Miss McGuire wanted to know, but it revealed something else. So this is me trying not to read the answer choices and trying to come up with my own answer first. And then I'm going to try to match it back to what the answer choices are saying. And I like to kind of do it from D to A. Transition from a summary of McGuire's findings to no, because we did not have... Um, her findings and um, not summary and then description of her methods. That's just not true. That's not what this paragraph does. Identify an important finding of Maguire's study of mental athletes. Well, that's kind of true because um, that's the finding. The brain, they were less active and the control subjects seem to be working on overdrive in mental athletes. Great. Speculate on the reasons of Maguire's unexpected results. It's not speculating on the reasons. All of it is wrong. First of all, it's not speculating on <laughs> the reasons. It's not reasons. So you know how there was a trap? Perfect answer apart from this one word. Actually, this, this is not a perfect answer and none of the words make sense. Relate McGuire's study of mental athletes to her study of taxi drivers. Well, it is relating the fact that there is a difference, but it's not mentioning taxi drivers. So, goodbye, and C is right. Do you see? You can just eliminate, and then you know which one is correct. Okay, we have two more paragraphs left. Surprisingly, when the mental athletes were learning new information, they were engaging several regions of the brain known to be involved in two specific tasks, visual memory and spatial navigation, including the same right posterior hippocampal region that the London cabbies had enlarged with all their daily way finding. At first glance, this wouldn't seem to make any sense. Why would mental athletes be conjuring images in their mind's eye when they were trying to learn three digit numbers? Why would they were have why would they be navigating like London cabbies when they're supposed to be remembering the shapes of snowflakes? Okay, so we are asked about this and I think question number question number 52. This was asking us about the questions and lines primarily serve to what do they do? They are basically asking why would they be using this part of the brain? Questioning something? So, raise doubts about the rail of reliability? Absolutely not. Summarize and elaborate on initially puzzling results of um, McGuire's study of, well, 
Does it, does it elaborate? I don't think that it's elaborating. Uh, imply that McGuire's findings undermine early studies. I don't know, it doesn't undermine anything. Introduce and explain the connection between McGuire's two studies and her earlier work. Now I'm stuck. Why would mental athletes be conjuring images in their mind's eye when they were trying to learn three-digit numbers? Why should they be navigating like London cabbies when they're supposed to be remembering the shapes of snowflakes? Let's just read a little bit above. At first glance, this wouldn't seem to make any sense. Emphasize and elaborate on initially puzzling results of McGuire's study on mental athletes. I think this is the only one that's possible because all the other answer choices are just because introduce and explain the connection between the two studies. There's no connection between the two studies. This answer choice, guys, is actually given for somebody who chose who ch we just had an answer to we had just had an answer about taxi drivers where it was we just had this i lost 42 43 44 45 46 47 48 yeah it is actually for somebody who would choose a for 48 and I guarantee you, this person would choose D for 52 because it's mentioning their favorite taxi drivers again. It's not about the taxi drivers. We're done with the taxi drivers in the first paragraph. All right, now let's just finish reading. McGuire and her team asked the mental athletes to describe exactly what was going on through their mind as they memorized. The mental athletes said they were consciously converting the information they were being asked to memorize into images and distributing those images along familiar spatial journeys. They weren't doing this automatically or because it was an inborn talent. They'd nurtured since childhood, rather, and the unexpected patterns of neural activity that McGuire's fMRI turned up were the results of training and practice. So these are results of training and practice. Great. Now let's take a look at what we did not answer yet. So the very first two questions, 42 and 43. The passage, according to the passage, McGuire's findings regarding drivers are significant because they, okay, 8 to 12, 12 to 16, 17 to 20, 20 to 26. So we basically need to be looking from um, somewhere from here to here because 8 to 12, the right difference. The right posterior hippocampus, a part of the brain known to be involved in spatial navigation, was 7% larger than normal cabbies, a small but very significant difference. Well, Maggie's findings in her text are significant because. Are they significant because of the 7%? I don't think so. I don't think it's tying it back to significance yet. So from 12 to 16, McGuire effect. Let's go to 12. McGuire concluded that all that way finding around law had physically altered the gross structure of their brains. The more years Cabby had been on the road, the more pronounced the effect. Okay, so significance. I don't know. I'm not sold on that yet. And now 17 to 20, the brain neuroplasticity. The brain is a mutable organ capable within limits of recognizing itself and readapting to new kinds of sensory input, a phenomenon known as neuroplasticity. All right, that could be possible because this is actually um, tying it to um, significance. But let's see what 2026 does. It had truth, 20. It had been thought that the adult brain was incapable of um, building new neurons. Those learning caused synapses to rearrange themselves and new links between the brain cells. The brain's um, basic anatomical structure was more or less, um, the Maguire study suggested that all inherited wisdom was simply untrue. I like that more. I think that this is significantly um, arguing against that our brain is static. So I like D because it's significant. Findings are significant, not the taxi drivers. To demonstrate the validity of a new method, no, she's not validating a new method. Provide evidence for a popular viewpoint. This is not a popular viewpoint because everyone thought that the brain was static. 
call into question an earlier consensus. I like that. Challenge the authenticity of previous da data. Challenge previous data would have been great. Authenticity is the answer trap that I was telling you about. Perfect answer apart from this one word. So it's CDD, CB on this side, AC49, according to that, when compared to mental athletes. The individuals in the control group in Maguire's second study. Okay, we actually had control group mentioned only once with the, with the study. The researchers um, matched control group and, are, and scanned them to memorize three-digit numbers. Uh, team thought it was possible. The researchers reviewed the brains of mental athletes. The more every single test cognitive ability, the mental athletes scored more. The only thing we know about the control group is that regions of the brain that were less active in the control group seem to be working on overdrive for the mental athletes. That's the only thing we know about them. So I can't really come up with an answer choice myself, so I'm just going to have to um, do elimination. Showed less brain activity overall. Well, that's just not true. They did not show less brain activity. The brain activity was similar. It's just like in certain areas where it wasn't as active, the mental athletes were just like going on overdrive and demonstrated a wider range of cognitive ability. No, this is another trap because who demonstrated a wider range of cognitive ability? The mental athletes. Here we're asked about the control group. Again, classical trap. Um, it uses words from the passage, says something else. Exhibited different patterns of brain activity. Did they? Oh, yes, they did. Displayed noticeably smaller hippocampal re regions. Absolutely not. This is what they were trying to do because they are using word hippocampal region. Um, but then they're saying that it's 7%. All of it is wrong because 7% is not noticeably larger. And then hippocampal region here is used only in a connection to visual memory and spatial navigation. So trap has to be C. So 50. This is, these are our last two, pass, last two questions. The passage most strongly suggests that mental athletes are successful at memorization because all right, why are they successful at memorization? Because, well, they practice and they use areas that other people don't use. Is that why? Okay. Um, Expertise, ex because they exercise their brain regularly through puzzles and other mental challenges. Well, actually, there was nothing about puzzles and other mental challenges. Um, so, yeah. Turned up were the results of training and practice. Yeah, nothing about puzzles. So that is going to be an example that is too narrow. The word puzzles just uh, ruins it. Organize information into numerical lists prior to its memorization. Again, we have no proof for that. Convert information they're trying to memorize into abstract symbols. Well, uh, do we have proof for that? I don't think so. Okay, let's take a look. 66 to 72, surprisingly, wayfinding. 66, surprisingly, when mental athletes were learning new information, they were engaged engaging several re regions of the brain to be involved in two specific tasks. Including posterior hippocampus. Where's wayfinding? Wayfinding is at 72. Oh, okay. So all the way to, yeah, right there. Okay. So I think this is, what was the question again? Suggests that mental athletes are successful at memorization because mental athletes were learning new information they were engaging. I think this is it. I think this is it because 72 at first, uh, at first glance, this wouldn't seem to make sense. No goodbye. 79.81, McGuire memorized. McGuire and her team were mental athletes described exactly what they were going through their mind as they memorized. No, that does not answer our question of why mental athletes were successful at memorization. So let's just check out 85.87, they childhood. Um, they weren't doing this automatically or because it was an inborn talent they'd nurtured since childhood. Okay. They weren't doing it automatically. This wasn't... Mm, but they were successful not because they weren't doing it automatically. Not because it wasn't... Yeah. D is another trap. So A has to be giving us the right answer choice. 
exploits part of the brain not normally used in routine memorization. Well, routine memorization, that kind of spooks me. Convert information they are trying to memorize into abstract symbols. Hmm. Let me check back on that. So 60, surprisingly, mental athletes were learning. They were engaging several regions of the brain, known to be most specific and visual and spatial, including the same right posterior hippocampus region, enlarged with their way finding. Well, they were successful because they were using their, because they, um, the mental athletes, uh, because they exploit parts of the brain not normally used in routine memorization. I think we're just going to have to go with that. The word routine, I'm just going to have to live with it. Convert information they're trying to memorize into, no, not that. All right, well, I think it's time for us to check answer choices. Um, I showed you where I hesitated. I didn't do this passage before we spoke, so let's check the answers. Gosh, this was intense. I'm so happy we're done with the passage now. I hope I was able to help you see how I'm approaching the, strat the passages, what my strategy is, what I look at first, how I read and solve passages at the same time, and how I interpret incorrect answer choices. I plan on doing a lot more of these if you let me know that those are helpful to you. I have a little bit of a, a different take on each type of a passage if it's a paired passage. Um, so I plan on making more of these if you guys like them and find them helpful. But for now, let's just uh, actually check answer choices. I'm sure most of you know how to do that, but just in case, did you know you can just Google college read readiness Oh, you can just do SAT answers, PDF 5, and the answers appear. You don't even need to buy the blue book, but I'm sure you, you know this already. So we're going all the way to question 42. Let's see what they say. All right, for 42, we said C, and they said C. Whew. 43, uh, we said D, they said D. For 44, we said D, they said D. For 45, we said C, and they said C. For 46, we said B, and they said B. Good. Moving along. 47, oh, we said A, and they said A. 48, C. 49, C. 50 is A, and last two questions, we said, oh yeah, I did not circle it, but I totally thought it was A, and A, and 52, drum roll, 52, 52, 52, 52 was B. So we didn't make any errors, and when I say we, I actually mean I, <laughs> no, I'm totally joking. Um, the last time I did this passage was years ago, so I just really wanted to do it on the spot and um, just test out my logic. I hope that was helpful for you guys, and you are now much more comfortable knowing that there's only one answer choice. And because SAT is standardized, it's actually great. And there's no such thing as, well, it could be this and it could be that. If you're really thinking that it could be both, you either misunderstood the passage or you need to be looking for clues in the question. I need to get better at identifying um, trappy answer choices. And remember, it's either restatement or demonstration. The question is either, the answer choice is either restating something that's in the passage, paraphrasing, or it's demonstrating. If there's an example or scenario, it's going to demonstrate it in the answer choice. or if there's a statement, it's going to appear as an example or scenario and an answer choice. And it always has to be that. And um, I hope you liked this little episode. And uh, let me know um, when you're taking your SAT. I'll see you guys later. Bye.